think we are all ready to leave the phenomenal world and enter into the sublime? Those experienced with online communities centered on diets and health are likely familiar with the dueling studies phenomenon of argumentation. Aha, says the vegan. Here is a study showing that all-cause mortality is decreased by a vegan diet. Au contraire, retorts the meatist. I have one showing no increase in mortality from a largely unprocessed diet that includes meat. My study was conducted for longer. Mine had a larger sample size. Yours is confounded by this, this, and this. Why is it that evidence is often present on both sides of these contentious questions? Of course, evidence must be present on both sides for a question to be contentious, else there's nothing to argue about. More on this later. Why then do questions of diet, supplements, exercise, drugs, etc., as they relate to health, act like factories for producing contention? Is there a natural reason for this? Could it be that any nutritional, pharmacological, or lifestyle intervention, either adopted or ceased, can be shown to have some beneficial effect over some time period? Fish oil, or omega-3 fatty acid supplementation, is good for you. It doesn't do anything. It's bad for you. Fasting decreases inflammation. Fasting is a physiological stressor. Eggs cause heart disease. Eggs prevent heart disease. Fiber, like in bran muffins, is protective against colon cancer. Fiber has no effect on colon cancer risk. Perhaps. It even increases it from chronic mucosal irritation. Sugar is a treatment for diabetes. Sugar causes diabetes. Interleukin-6 is inflammatory. Interleukin-6 is anti-inflammatory. Radiation treats acne. Radiation causes cancer. Radiation both cures and causes cancer. These statements are all correct, as far as that goes, but can one determine which are true, and is there a difference between the two? Does a statement such as, cholesterol causes heart disease, or saturated fat is healthy, even make sense? Consider a bladed weapon striking scaled armor and being repelled. Did the armor stop the blade? Was the scale it bounced off of responsible, or was it the ones it met before? Did the comprehensive unit of scaled armor collectively absorb the shock, meaning that if only the scales that made contact with the blade were present, it wouldn't have been effective? What if the angle of attack was changed or the blade was swung with more force or was heavier? What if the difference between a blade sliding away versus sinking into the wearer's shoulder is a few degrees difference in the angle that a single scale was facing at the precise moment the blade met it? How would one ever discover this was the deciding factor? Now, consider that human health, that of research animals, or even the physiological state of a single cell is an infinitely more complex system than that of the scaled armor and the blade. Whole body physiology would be a shirt of armor with infinitely small scales, all in their own individual states of repair or disrepair, all connected to and affecting each other to varying degrees. Physiological challenges are likewise complex and varied. The body adapts to changes in its environment, but are these adaptations good or bad? Perhaps an adaptation is good now, but bad for the long term, or vice versa. Is there an objective way to assign good or bad to changes with temporal aspects to them, or to a treatment that is beneficial for one tissue, but harmful to another? One man may smoke cigarettes for his entire life and die in his 90s with no evidence of lung disease. Another may smoke for 20 years and get lung cancer. Does smoking then cause cancer or not cause cancer? One may look at differences between the two men, their diets and lifestyles, levels of stress. Perhaps one of them had a genetic predisposition to lung cancer. Look how far afield we quickly move from the simple question of whether smoking causes cancer. Essentially, there is no way to, without a biasing framework, determine good or bad in complex systems like physiology. Unlike a physics exercise, such as a free body problem, these questions are open and can enter an endless loop of, compared to what? This gives rise to the phenomenon, as mentioned previously, of contentious questions. 
that is, questions for which evidence is present on opposing sides. The potential for contentious questions increases with the complexity of a system. Thus, research benefits from reducing this complexity. Techniques of experimental design, such as models and controls, exist for this purpose. Models are simplified systems that, one hopes, represent key aspects of the system being studied, such as animal experimentation on drugs intended for human use. Controls attempt to level all factors extraneous to the experimental variable. Well-designed and parametized experiments produce cleaner results that are more easily analyzed and interpreted than uncontrolled natural systems. What then develops is an inherent tension between the need for reduction of complexity in experimentation and the resulting data being useful for the real world. The reduction in complexity imposed by controlled experimentation simultaneously and necessarily opposes its own applicability to the natural system. This antagonistic relationship is the source of contentious questions, and one may predict that the contentiousness of a question, the amount of producible data on both sides of it, is proportional to its complexity. To restate Kyle's first law, any nutritional, pharmacological, or lifestyle intervention, either adopted or ceased, can be shown to have some beneficial effect over some time period. This law best applies to questions such as general health, someone feeling better, better today or better throughout a lifetime. The less complex a question is, such as the acute effects of a drug on a symptom, the more easily an experiment can be conducted that applies well to the natural system. The more complex a question, such as the chronic effects of a change in diet across varied populations, the less any experiment can directly and wholly address it. This is not to say that there aren't answers to questions, or that some answers aren't better than others. There are better answers, and worse answers, and there is superior and inferior science. Sometimes there is outright fraud. However, even without these human shortcomings, complex systems would still produce contentious questions, as per Kyle's first law. What then can be done about it? This will be addressed in future essays, but one simple trick that doctors hate is to apply a concept of organismal intentionality. Take inflammation as an example, which is considered universally bad. Pro-inflammatory is bad, and anti-inflammatory is good. There are basically no nutritional or pharmacological interventions being recommended on the basis of increasing inflammation. There are, however, contentious questions about what causes inflammation, what best resolves it, and even, strangely, what it is. Why does inflammation exist? Was it a mistake of biology to create it? Why does your nose swell up and impede your breathing when someone gives you a bonk? Why have this physiological design that requires us to periodically apply ice packs to our bodies? Isn't that retarded? Ask yourself what the organism may intend when it does something like produce inflammation. Some of the same cytokines and chemoattractants that make your nose swell and that are implicated in chronic inflammatory conditions are present in coagulating blood after a cut. What would happen if they didn't exist? A relatively minor cut would be a serious bleeding risk and without medical techniques could even be fatal. A sprain to modern people is an inconvenience but the swelling and even scar tissue produced by joint inflammation could keep a joint functional enough to allow for the survival of a primitive hunter. When viewed this way, inflammation is a protective action by the body that has been rendered superfluous by medicine. This can be contrasted with the chronic metabolic inflammation seen in diabetes and heart disease. Differences in inflammation profiles, so to speak, might suggest the categories of benign and pernicious. If a pernicious inflammation is found, it would make sense to try to stop it, but it would be silly to treat an open wound attempting to close itself with congealing blood tissue with an anti-inflammatory. The complex gut microbiome field is, unsurprisingly, full of contentious questions. Consider disease symptoms linked to the presence of a pathological bacterial strain in the gut. Two teams study this question, and it is found that both probiotics and antibiotics are an effective treatment. How could this be? Based on what we know about the gut microbiome, this could very well happen via known mechanisms. The antibiotics could remove the pathogenic bacteria, 
why other probiotics could suppress it with competition. Without this background knowledge, and simply seeing the results that both adding bacteria and adding drugs that kill bacteria treat the same problem, an intransigent, contentious question would form from the presence of evidence on what appear to be diametrically opposed sides. To further investigate the question, one could look into why the pathogenic bacteria became established in the first place, whether it was a deficiency of competing bacteria or a deficiency in gut secretions or peristalsis. Perhaps the subjects added something to their diet that shifted the bacterial balance, or maybe removing something from their diet produced dysbiosis. A comparison with healthy, unaffected individuals would be helpful. In many ways, people use this perspective intuitively. Women consider the state of their reproductive health as indicative of their health overall. Why do they do this? This perspective utilizes an understanding that, as biological organisms, reproduction is in strict alignment with organismal intent, and a breakdown in reproductive health would correlate with a breakdown in health overall. For similar reasons, increases in lean mass over fat mass, higher energy levels, better sleep, improved mood, are all considered good outcomes in a common sense fashion. This is the key, the engine of Kyle's law, and of its effects on the interpretation of science. What is missing from scientific analysis is the ability of the analyst to apply the common sense that laypersons do to their lay observations to scientific questions and data, the ability to parse out signal from noise and intuit truths from technical information. This challenge is a consequence of technological science and its tendency to produce large volumes of counterintuitive information. One solution would be to reject technological science and return to monkey. This, however, would defeat the purpose, abandoning science in an effort to overcome its challenges. Instead, I propose we return to science some important and lost aspects of monkey, the understanding of life processes as purposeful and directed towards the ends of organismal survival.